Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey friend, how you doing? Today we're going to be discussing the terrifying true story that inspired a fantastic creature feature called Jeepers Creepers. That was a mouthful. That's what she said. Jeepers Creepers, where'd you get those peepers? Yeah, the horror movie. You know the one? Well apparently it's based on a true story. But before we get started, if you are new here, if this is your first video, or if you have not yet, please join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. Each week I put out a new morbid makeup video, which is me telling you a true crime story while I put on a full face of makeup, and it's a lot of fun, and I would love it if you would hang out with us here. You should do it. One of us. One of us. One of us. So I thought today's video would be the perfect video to transition out of Halloween content and back into true crime content. It's my last Halloween video went up on Thursday and Halloween it was Saturday and today when you're watching this, it's Monday. Okay, cool, Brittany. <laughs> Thanks for the weekly recap. Jesus. <laughs> but yeah, I thought it would be the perfect video because it is true crime, but it's got a little horror sprinkled in. Sprinkle, sprinkle, sprinkle some horror. Horror, horror. Anyone else have trouble with that word? Okay. Sometimes fact is scarier than fiction, and I think this case represents that pretty well, so let's just get into it. This is the story of the real-life monster that inspired the movie Jeepers Creepers, a man named Dennis DePuel. So, 11 years prior to the Jeepers Creepers movie that was released in 2001, in N April of 1990, 49-year-old Marilyn DePuel was reported missing by one of her three children from her home in Coldwater, Michigan. So Marilyn was born January 24th, 1941, making her an Aquarius, and she was married to a 47-year-old man named Dennis DePew, who was born June 13th of 1943, and this made him a Gemini. And for all intents and purposes, the DePews were seen as a normal, happy, content, middle-class family. They had two daughters together and a son that they raised as a family. Um, Marilyn worked as a high school guidance counselor, and Dennis worked as a property, property, property accessor. What is that anyway? It might as well be a trans monster. So though the family, you know, put on a happy face and tried to seem like a good, stable, happy household, inside the home, the marriage between Dennis and Marilyn was deteriorating. Dennis had become withdrawn, grumpy, and accusatory. He would often start fights with Marilyn and he would do this in front of his kids and the kids would see it. So they weren't like the biggest fan of their dad, but in Dennis's eyes, it was Marilyn who was turning his kids against him, not, you know, his kids making their own decisions based on seeing him not be very nice to their mother. This behavior exhausted Marilyn. She, she was just over it. She wanted out of the relationship. She told her coworkers that she wanted a divorce, that she just wanted to get out and get away and get on her own and just get away from Dennis. She wasn't happy in the marriage anymore. So after 18 years of marriage in 1989, Marilyn had decided enough was enough. She wanted to move on and she wanted to have her own life. She wanted to be able to make her own decisions without being under the domineering and controlling thumb of her husband, Dennis. I'm sure a lot of women, especially then, well, maybe now too. I, I'm not sure. I haven't been in a bad relationship like that, but she, what the hell? But she wanted out. She wanted to do her own thing. So she went and she filed for a divorce. So apparently during the divorce, Dennis was actually really accommodating. He was down to let Marilyn have anything she wanted and she, anything she asked for, he was like, fine, fine, fine. And I think myself that it's because he wanted to show her like what a good guy he was, make her rethink her decisions and question like, should I leave him? Look at how good he is being. Maybe I'm acting crazy, like sort of gaslighting her because Dennis didn't want to get divorced, but you know what? Despite all his efforts, the divorce did get finalized and Marilyn was free. And now with all of the things she wanted because he just let her have it. <sighs> so you may notice that uh, I look a little different from the last clip you saw to this clip. Well, let me, let me just explain real quick. I filmed almost the entire video except for my lips, right? And then I realized that my battery is about to die. So I went to change my battery. In changing my battery, I realized, ah, oh, man, my mic's been off this whole time. So, put a new mic in. No, no. Put a new battery in. Turn the mic on. No. <laughs> oh my God. So I put a new battery in and I filmed the whole rest of the video. And then I went to watch the footage and I realized I never turned my mic back on. So, 
This is now my third time filming this video. Welcome back. Things are going really well now that Halloween's over, obviously. Thank you. <laughs> Let me go ahead and um, tell you the rest of the story after Marilyn's divorce. Uh, and I'm so sorry that there's not going to be makeup application. I've already done it. So sorry. So let me go ahead and tell you the rest of the story. She's just jeepers creepers. Okay, so in the divorce, Dennis was granted bi-weekly visits with his kids, but his kids weren't really excited to spend time with him. They didn't want to go with him on his designated days and they'd be like, Mom, I don't want to go, you know, things like that. And this kind of pissed Dennis off, right? As I'm sure you would imagine that it would, especially since he thought that Marilyn was turning his kids against him, right? So in the divorce, he also got access to a guest house that was on the property. Apparently they had a guest house and he used that as like an office space to do his, his work as a trance monster. So he would go there during the day to do his work, but really he was there to keep tabs on his family, to keep tabs on Marilyn, to keep her at arm's reach, to keep her under his thumb and to show her that no matter what she did, no matter what she tried, he would always be around. You divorce me? Well, guess what? I'm still here. And another way that he asserted his dominance over her, even though she was no longer married to him, is that she'd, you know, go to work, go out for the day, she'd come home, and even though she changed her locks, she would find this in her house. Even though he didn't live there anymore. I would be so pissed. So, with everything going on and everything falling apart around him, Dennis was having a bit of a hard time, you see, because Dennis had created his idea his entire identity around Dennis the husband, Dennis the father, Dennis the family man. And seeing as how his marriage was ending, he was kicked out of his house, his kids didn't want anything to do with him, and his masculinity is being challenged by his wife having the audacity to leave him, he was going into a depression. And was he dealing with this depression in a healthy way? No. He was telling people that he wanted to kill himself and that he wanted to kill his ex-wife. Red flags all over the place. Easter Sunday, 1990. Dennis drives over to his wife's house, his old house, to pick up his kids because it's his day, it's his time for his visit with his kids, right? So when he gets there, his youngest daughter is like, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to go with you, dad. I'm not interested. I'm not going. So he is upset. He's pissed. He is scorned and rejected. So he goes to his son and he kind of like grabs him and tries to strong arm him into going with, with Dennis to leave with him. So Marilyn sees this and she's like, nah, and she intervenes. She gets between them and she's like, bro, if he doesn't want to go with you, he doesn't have to go with you. Or whatever, like a strong mama bear would say in that situation, defending her kid. Well, this pissed Dennis off. Her presence honestly probably pissed him off because he probably had a lot of built up resentment towards her. So an argument started and that argument quickly turned physically violent with Dennis shoving her down a flight of stairs, her landing at the bottom in the basement. Dennis then proceeded to walk down the stairs of the basement and beat the crap out of Marilyn while she's all dazed and confused at the bottom of the stairs. After just falling down a flight of stairs, he starts to beat the crap out of her. And all of this is happening in front of their three children. No wonder they don't want to see you, you dick. So while all of this is happening, the oldest of the Depew daughters did call the police, but unfortunately the police would be too late because Dennis then forces dazed and bloody Marilyn up the stairs and he tells his kids like, yo, I'm sorry, I overreacted. I'm gonna take your mom to the hospital because she's in bad shape. <sighs> but unfortunately, this was a lie. We know this was a lie, otherwise you and I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be telling you the story. So Dennis leaves in his van with his ex-wife. Upon showing up at the house and hearing the story from the kids, the cops are like, oh, shiv, and they start immediately looking for Dennis and Marilyn. Now, this is where we're going to come to the parallels between the real life story and the Jeepers Creepers movie. I'm sure you were like, hello, where is it? This is it. So that same day, Easter Sunday, 1990, married couple Ray and Marie Thornton are in their car and they're just going on a little drive, spending some time together real casual when they end up on a normally deserted stretch of Michigan back road. The couple had been driving around playing the license plate game together where they'd come upon a car and they'd see the license plate numbers and letters and try to like put together a word or a sentence, something in lead, you know, something like that. 
and they're driving, they're hanging out, and all of a sudden this van pulls up quickly behind them, swerves around them, and takes off in like a huge hurry, driving like a dick. And Marie notices as the van passes that the first two license plate uh, letters were G and Z, and she's like, geez, that guy's in a hurry, you know, playing the license plate game. They laugh, haha, -ha, so funny, and they put it out of their minds until, of course, they come upon an abandoned old schoolhouse. So, as the couple approaches the schoolhouse in their car, they look over and they see that that van is pulled over at that schoolhouse and that the driver is out of the van and he's carrying a bloody sheet. They can see the blood from their car. So they continue driving and they're like, holy what did we just see? What is going on? But before they can really like wrap their heads around what they've seen and decide what they want to do, Dennis is behind them in his van and he follows them for a couple of miles. Can you imagine how scary that would be in that situation given what you had just seen? Ray is driving and he sees that there is a road that he can turn off, turn off of the highway and get off and get away. So he does that. He turns and the van keeps going. So they're like, okay, they pull over and they're like, what the did we just see? What is going on? What is happening? And they decide that they should get back on the highway and get behind the van so that they can get the rest of the license plate number because this guy was clearly up to no good. So they do just that. They turn around, they get back on the highway, and when they get back on the highway, they realize that the van has pulled over to the side of the road. And as if reading their minds, he is removing his license plates. So they're like, very suspicious. And as they're driving by, they also notice that the passenger side door of the car is covered in blood. So they make the decision, a decision, to turn around and to go back to the schoolhouse and see what evidence might have been there, see if he left anything behind, just do a little investigating, which is just is it brave or is it dumb? I don't know. Maybe a little bit of both because, okay, this is the point in a horror movie, especially in Jeepers Creepers, where the brother and the sister go back to the church to see what they had seen the creature throw down the, the tunnel. This is the part in the movie where I'm like, no, 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 no. Just go and just go. But, you know, this was 1990. They couldn't really call anybody. Cell phones weren't a thing yet. When did cell phones become a thing? I don't know. I had a pager while I was in junior high, so... Wow. That really ages me. Oh my gosh. When you're watching this, my birthday's in two days. I'm turning 32, so since I aged myself, I might as well just say, hold on, I'm 32. Anyway. Anyway, so the couple goes back, right? And when they get there, what they find is a bloody sheet that was partially shoved into a hole in the ground that looked like an animal had dug. So this guy was trying to hide the bloody sheet. Fortunately for them though, he was not hiding the body. Maybe he was and he was interrupted and he was like, oh shit, like maybe he was starting to put her in there and then saw them and it's like, okay, I can't do this and left and forgot the sheet. I don't really know where his mind was then, but they found a bloody sheet, but fortunately not Marilyn's body, which is good for them because can you imagine how traumatizing it would be to find a dead body? I have never, hopefully you have never either, but it sounds like it would just ruin you a little bit like oh so this is this video is a mess so the couple ended up contacting the police and the police quickly put two and two together like okay the description of the van the proximity of the church to the Depew home so they headed over to investigate and when they got there they quickly found evidence that showed to them that Marilyn was probably no longer alive the bloody sheet there was a pool of blood a rather large pool of blood at at the schoolhouse. Um, there were tire tracks that matched the Depew van and the blood ended up matching Marilyn's blood type. Blood type. Blood in general. It was her blood. And they were quickly proven to be correct because the following day Marilyn's body was discovered by highway road workers. Her body was found in a ditch on the side of the road like a piece of trash and she had suffered from one gunshot wound to the back of her head. And Dennis was in the wind. Dennis was on the run, right? And while on the run, he started to send a bunch of letters to friends, family, people in his life, trying to justify him murdering his wife. He was like, you know, if she had just been nice to me during the divorce, none of this would have to happen. You know, just victim blaming, trying to put all of the responsibility of what he had done onto somebody else. Because 
he wanted to make himself seem like a better guy. I don't know, like that's possible at this point, guy. Okay, but anyway, he sent these letters and he sent about 20 of them and they were postmarked in a lot of different states which led the police to believe that he was moving around while on the run. And the case went cold for nearly a year. It took a year for the police to find Dennis, but they did end up finding him. And a great part of why they ended up finding him is because Dennis's case, the case of his wife's murder, was featured on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries. So apparently Dennis had been living under a fake name in Dallas, Texas, and Dennis had been living with his new girlfriend. In March of 1991, the day that the Unsolved Mysteries episode featuring his wife's murder aired, okay, Dennis's girlfriend came home to find him frantic. He was running around their place, throwing all of his stuff in boxes, packing everything up. He said that there was a family emergency and he needed to leave immediately and alone. And she didn't believe him. She thought he was acting super weird. He was taking more than he needed. and. The TV was on and it seemed like he was trying to block it, right? And on the TV was that episode of Unsolved Mysteries and she was like, okay, why is he blocking the TV? And to me, I'm like, why didn't he just turn it off? I don't know, not a smart guy, obviously, but either way, he's packing up all his stuff and she's like, okay, and he's like, okay, so I'm gonna go, but can you, can you please make me a sandwich for the road? So she does. Okay, and he takes a sandwich and he takes all his belongings and he gets in his van and he takes off and she knows at that point that she's never gonna see him again. She just got the vibe, I guess. I don't know, women's intuition. She knew she was never gonna see him again. And it was that night that she realized that her boyfriend, a man that she knew as Hank, was actually a wife-killing bastard named Dennis Dipu. So. The girlfriend then called the police and she gave them Dennis's new Texas license plate number and they started to look. He was finally discovered um, in Louisiana near the border of Louisiana and Mississippi. A car chase ensued. This car chase ended up ending on the other side of the border in Mississippi after Dennis had driven his van through two police barricades and slammed his car into several police cars. So, since Dennis refused to stop the van, he'd been smashing into everything, the cops started to try to shoot out his tires, right? So they shoot out the back two tires and the van comes to a stop. And Dennis starts to shoot at the cops. He shoots a couple shots through the windshield, a couple shots through the, the car window, and police start to open fire. But Dennis's car is filled with like the cardboard boxes since he was on the run, and they don't hit him with their bullets. But seeing is that he couldn't drive anywhere, the police are firing at him, he's already fired at police, he realizes that there's no way out of this. So he puts the gun in his mouth and he pulls the trigger, taking his own life. And that's the story, guys. There's no good ending, there's no resolution, no one saw justice for this woman losing her life. This guy just killed himself and left it open forever. These kinds of cases to me are really sad because okay, I know that when we hear about people that kill people, sometimes we're like, oh, this person doesn't deserve to live. They deserve to die for the life that they took, which fair, but when the person actually kills themselves, it's so anticlimactic, right? And it feels like there's just no justice, right? There's no justice for this woman, there's no justice for her kids, there's no justice for her parents. Because at the time that she died, her parents were both still alive. So they had to live through this. And I heard at least her mother said that she was ruined by this, right? She said that if her, her daughter had died in like a car accident or something, that's something that they could at least deal with and work through. But knowing that she was killed in such a violent way, they weren't able to ever get over that. And it's just really sad and pointless and avoidable, right? Because, okay, he killed her because he was pissed. He was pissed because he wanted, didn't want to lose his family and his reputation and his kids, right? But in killing her, he had to go on the run and he lost all of those things anyway, right? So, it, so it's just so dumb. He could have just taken the divorce, dealt with it in a healthy way, moved on. They both could have moved on. He could have still gotten a new girlfriend. She could have moved on and maybe met somebody else if she wanted to. And their kids would still have two parents instead of no parents. Because of him, they had no parents. And I know that that's a bummer, man, but that's the story of Dennis DePew, the monster who inspired one of my all-time favorite horror movies, Jeepers Creepers. I just love this movie, man. I watch it every year. I watch it every October. I watch it several times periodically throughout the year. I just think it's really great. I think it's a fun ride. I love Justin Long. I think he's so, so underrated. I just, I love him. And anyways, I know this is a very 
obviously a loose interpretation of like based on a true story because spoiler alert there is no demon monster who has to you know eat your organs in order to become whole every like 23 or 27 years and there is no house of pain where you know he puts his bodies and like staples them to the walls and mummifies them and keeps them forever i know i know i know but as much as i love this movie because i do i think in this in this situation fact is scarier than fiction hear me out a man-eating demon is just that a man-eating demon he's a one-trick pony he does one thing he shows up and he eats you that's his thing scary yes but a husband a father a family man a person that you loved so much at one point that you married you raised kids with you built a life with right the fact that this person could then kill you erase you from existence throw you on the side of the road like a piece of trash like you don't matter at all the fact that you could think you know someone so well and have no idea who they are and how evil they can be that is scarier than monsters to me people are scarier to me but anyways guys that completes this video i am so sorry that there wasn't like the makeup application thing i think you just got to see the base you didn't get to see any of this like 80s magic happen and i'm so sorry for that um this was the most annoying filming process of my life i almost scratched it but i really wanted to film this video uh it's thursday right now the thursday that i'm uploading the amityville horror video so if you haven't seen that i'll link it um so i want to get this up on monday i want this to be the first video that you guys see when when Halloween's over because i think it's that good transition from creepy halloween to creepy real you know so i hope you like it i'm sorry about the makeup thing there will be makeup next week i'm so sorry um i hope you still liked it though i hope it was informative and i hope it gave you everything you would want from this case of course let me know down below of what cases you would like to see me cover because i do have an ongoing list and i do have some that are pre-recorded but you're filled with good taste and good ideas otherwise you wouldn't be here right so i'd love to add your ideas to my list and of course if you haven't yet please join the brat pack by subscribing and ringing that bell i put out new videos every week morbid makeup every day every day every day all the days every week i put out a new morbid makeup video and i would love to hang out with you specifically you and yeah that's it guys this was tight you are tight and I hope to see you in my next video.